Chapter 6 of The Door Through Space. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot O R G. Recording by Christy Nowak. The Door Through Space by Marion Zimmer Bradley. Chapter 6. Once we were free of the forest, the road to the dry towns lay straight before us, with no hidden dangers. Some of us limped for a day or two, or favored an arm or leg clawed by the catmen, but I knew that what Corral said was true. It was a lucky caravan which had to fight off only one attack. Quinn haunted me. A night or two of turning over his cryptic words in my mind had convinced me that whoever, or whatever he'd been signaling, it wasn't the catmen and his urgent question, where's the girl, swam endlessly in my brain, making no more sense than when I had first heard it. Who had he mistaken me for? What did he think I was mixed up in? And who, above all, were the others who had to be signaled at the risk of an attack by Catman, which had meant his own death? With Quinn dead, and Carol thinking I'd saved his life, a large part of the responsibility for the caravan now fell on me. And strangely, I enjoyed it, making the most of this interval when I was separated from the thought of blood feud or revenge, the need of spying, or the threat of exposure. During those days and nights on the trail, I grew back slowly into the dry towner I once had been. I knew I would be sorry when the walls of Shainsa rose on the horizon, bringing me back, inescapably, to my own quest. We swung wide, leaving the straight trail to Shainsa, and Carol announced his intention of stopping for half a day at Canarsa, one of the walled, non-human cities which lay well off the travelled road. To my inadvertent show of surprise, he returned that he had trading connections there. "'We all need a day's rest, and the silent ones will buy from me, though they have few dealings with men. Look here. I owe you something. You have lenses? You can get a better price in Canarsa than you'd get in Ardkaran or Shainsa. Come along with me, and I'll vouch for you.' Kiral had been most friendly since the night I had dug him out from under the catmen, and I knew no way to refuse without exposing myself for the sham traitor I was. But I was deathly apprehensive. Even with recall, I had never entered any of the non-human towns. On Wolf, human and non-human have lived side by side for centuries, and the human is not always the superior being. I might pass among the dry towners and the relatively stupid humanoid chaks for another dry towner, but recall had cautioned me I could not pass among non humans for native wolfen, and warned me against trying. Nevertheless, I accompanied Kiral, carrying the box which had cost about a week's pay in the Terran zone and was worth a small fortune in the dry towns. Canarsa seemed inside the gates like any other town. The houses were round, beehive fashion, and the streets totally empty. Just inside the gates, a hooded figure greeted us, and gestured us by signs to follow him. He was covered from head to foot with some coarse and shiny fiber, woven into stuff that looked like sacking. But under the thick hooding was horror. It slithered, and it had nothing like a recognizable human shape or walk, and I felt the primeval ape in me cowering and gibbering in the corner of my mind. Kiral muttered close to my ear, No outsider is ever allowed to look on the silent ones in their real form. I think they're deaf and dumb, but be damn careful. You bet, I whispered, and was glad the streets were empty. I walked along, trying not to look at the gliding motion of the shrouded thing up ahead. The trading was done in an open hut of reeds, which looked as if it had been built in a hurry, and was not square, round, hexagonal, or any other recognizable geometrical shape. It formed a pattern of its own, presumably, but my human eyes couldn't see it. Kural said in a breath of a whisper, They'll tear it down and burn it after we leave. We're supposed to have contaminated it too greatly for any of the Silent Ones ever to enter again. My family has traded with them for centuries, and we're almost the only ones who have ever entered the city. Then two of the Silent Ones of Canarsa, also covered with that coarse, shiny stuff, slithered into the hut, and Kiral choked off his words as if he had swallowed them. It was the strangest trading I had ever done. Kiral laid out the small, forged steel tools and the coils of thin, fine wire, and I unpacked my lenses and laid them out in neat rows. The silent ones neither spoke nor moved, but through a thin piece in the gray veiling I saw a speck which might have been a phosphorescent eye moving back and forth as if scanning the things laid out for their inspection. I smothered a gasp, for suddenly blank spaces appeared in the rows of merchandise. Certain small tools, wire cutters, calipers, surgical scissors, had vanished, and all the coils of wire had disappeared. Blanks equally had appeared in the rows of lenses. All of my tiny, powerful microscope lenses had vanished. I cast a quick glance at Kiral, but he seemed unsurprised. I recalled vague rumors of the silent ones, and concluded that, eerie though it seemed, this was merely their way of doing business. 
Carol pointed at one of the tools, at an exceptionally fine pair of binocular lenses, and at the last coils of wire. The shrouded ones did not move, but the lenses and the wire vanished. The small tool remained, and after a moment, Carol dropped his hand. I took my cue from Carol and remained motionless, awaiting whatever surprise was coming. I had halfway expected what happened next. In the blank spaces, little points of light began to glimmer, and after a moment, blue and red and green gemstones appeared there. To me, the substitution appeared roughly equitable and fair, though I am no judge of the fine points of gems. Kiral scowled slightly and pointed to one of the green gems, and after a moment it whisked away and a blue one took its place. In another spot where a fine set of surgical instruments had lain, Kiral pointed at the blue gem which now lay there, shook his head, and held out three fingers. After a moment, a second blue stone lay winking beside the first. Kiral did not move, but inexorably held out the three fingers. There was a little swirling in the air, and then both gems vanished, and the case of surgical instruments lay in their place. Still, Kiral did not move, but held the three fingers out for a full minute. Finally, he dropped them and bent to pick up the case instruments. Again, the little swirl in the air, and the instruments vanished. In their place lay three of the blue gems. My mouth twitched in the first amusement I had felt since we entered this uncanny place. Evidently, bargaining with the silent ones was not a great deal different than bargaining with anyone, anywhere. Nevertheless, under the eyes of those shrouded but horrible forms, if they had eyes, which I doubted, I had no impulse to protest their offered prices. I gathered up the rejected lenses, repacked them neatly, and helped Kiral recreate the tools and instruments the silent ones had not wanted. I noticed that in addition to the microscope lenses and surgical instruments, they had taken all the fine wire. I couldn't imagine, and didn't particularly want to imagine, what they intended to do with it. On our way back through the streets, unshepherded this time, Kiral's tongue was loosened as if with a great release from tension. They're psychokinetics, he told me. Quite a few of the non-human races are. I guess they have to be, having no eyes and no hands. But sometimes I wonder if we of the dry towns ought to deal with them at all. What do you mean? I asked, not really listening. I was thinking mostly about the way the small objects had melted away and reappeared. The sight had stirred some uncomfortable memory, a vague sense of danger. It was not tangible enough for me to know why I feared it, but just a subliminal uneasiness that kept prodding at me, like a tooth that isn't quite aching yet. Kiral said, We of Shainsaw live between fire and flood. Terra on the one hand, and on the other, maybe something worse. Who knows? We know so little about the silent ones and those like them. Who knows? Maybe we're giving them the weapons to destroy us. He broke off with a gasp and stood staring down one of the streets. It lay open and bare between two rows of round houses, and Kiral was staring fixedly at a doorway which had opened there. I followed his paralyzed gaze and saw the girl. Hair like spun black glass fell in hard waves around her shoulders, and the red eyes smiled with alien malice, alien mischief, beneath the dark crown of little stars, and the toad god sprawled in hideous embroideries across the white folds of her breast. Kiral gulped hoarsely. His hand flew up as he clutched the charm strung about his neck, I imitated the gesture mechanically, watching Kiral, wondering if he would turn and run again, but he stood frozen for a minute. Then the spell broke, and he took one step toward the girl, arms outstretched. Maylin, he cried, and there was heartbreak in his voice. And again, the cry making ringing echoes in the strange street. Maylin, Maylin. This time it was the girl who whirled and fled. Her white robes fluttered, and I saw the twinkle of her flying feet as she vanished into the space between the houses and was gone. Kiral took one blind step down the street, then another, but before he could burst into a run I had him by the arm, dragging him back to sanity. Man, you've gone mad! Chase in a non-human town? He struggled for a minute, then with a harsh sigh he said, It's all right, I won't, and shook loose from my arm. He did not speak again until we reached the gates of Canarsa and they closed, silently and untouched, behind us. I had forgotten the place already. I had space only to think of the girl, whose face I had not forgotten since the moment when she saved me and disappeared. Now she had appeared again to Kiral. What did it all mean? I asked as we walked toward the camp, Do you know that girl? But I knew the question was futile. Kiral's face was closed, conceding nothing, and his friendliness had vanished completely. He said, Now you know. You saved me from the catmen, and again in Canarsa, so my hands are bound from harming you. But it is evil to have dealings with those who have been touched by the toad god. He spat noisily on the ground, looking at me with loathing, and said, We will reach Shane Sa in three days. Stay away from me. End of chapter 6
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot O R G. Recording by Christy Nowak. The Door Through Space by Marion Zimmer Bradley. Chapter 7. Shainsa, first, in the chain of dry towns that lie in the bed of a long dried ocean, is set at the center of a great alkali plain, a dusty, parched city, bleached by a million years of sun. The houses are high, spreading buildings with many rooms and wide windows. The poorer sort were made of sun-dried brick, the more imposing being cut from the bleached salt stone of the cliffs that rise behind the city. News travels fast in the dry towns. If Rakal were in the city, he'd soon know that I was here, and guess who I was, or why I'd come. I might disguise myself so that my own sister, or the mother who bore me, would not know me, but I had no illusions about my ability to disguise myself from Rakal. He had created the disguise that was me. When the second sun sat red and burning behind the salt cliffs, I knew he was not in Shainsa, but I stayed on, waiting for something to happen. At night I slept in a cubbyhole behind a wine shop, paying an inordinate price for that very dubious privilege. And every day, in the sleepy silence of the blood-red noon, I paced the public square of Shane Sa. This went on for four days. No one took the slightest notice of another nameless man in a shabby shirt-cloak without name or identity or known business. No one appeared to see me except the dusty children, with pale, fleecy hair, who played their patient games on the wind-swept curbing of the square. They surveyed my scarred face with neither curiosity or fear, and it occurred to me that Rindy might be such another as these. If I had still been thinking like an earthman, I might have tried to question one of the children, or win their confidence. But I had a deeper game in hand. On the fifth day I was so much a fixture that my pacing went unnoticed even by the children. On the gray moss of the square, a few dried-looking old men, their faces as faded as their shirt-cloaks and bearing the knife-scars of a hundred forgotten flights, drowsed on the stone benches. And along the flagged walk at the edge of the square, as suddenly as an autumn storm in the salt flats, a woman came walking. She was tall, with a proud swinging walk and a metallic clashing kept rhythm to her swift steps. Her arms were fettered each wrist bound with a jeweled bracelet, and the bracelets linked together by a long, silver-gilt chain passed through a silken loop at her waist. From the loop swung a tiny golden padlock, but in the lock stood an even tinier key, signifying that she was a higher caste than her husband or consort, and that her fettering was by choice, and not command. She stopped directly before me and raised her arm in formal greeting like a man. The chain made a tinkling sound in the hushed square, as her other hand was pulled up tight against the silken loop at her waist. She stood surveying me for a few moments, and finally I raised my head and returned her gaze. I don't know why I had expected her to have hair like spun black glass and eyes that burned with the red reflection of the burning star. This woman's eyes were darker than the poison berries of the salt cliffs, and her mouth was a cut berry that looked just as dangerous. She was young, the slimness of her shoulders and the narrow steel-chained wrists told me how very young she was. But her face had seen weather and storms, and her dark eyes had weathered worse psychic storms than that. She did not flinch at the sight of my scars, and met my gaze without dropping her eyes. "'You are a stranger. What is your business in Shainsaw?' I met the direct question with the insolence it demanded, hardly moving my lips. I have come to buy women for the brothels of Ardkaran. Perhaps when washed you might be suitable. Who could arrange for your sale? She took the rebuke impassively, though the bitter crimson of her mouth twitched a little in mischief, or rage. But she made no sign. The battle was joined between us, and I knew already that it would be fought to the end. From somewhere in her draperies something fell to the ground with a little tinkle. But I knew that trick, too, and I did not move. Finally she went away without bending to retrieve it, and when I looked around I saw that all the fleece-haired children had stolen away, leaving their playthings lying on the curb. But one or two of the gaffers on the stone benches, who were old enough to show curiosity without losing face, were watching me with impassive eyes. I could have asked the woman's name then, but I held back, knowing it could only lessen the prestige I had gained from the encounter. I glanced down, without seeming to do so, at the tiny mirror which had fallen from the recesses of the fur robe. Her name might have been inscribed on the reverse. 
but I left it lying there to be picked up by the children when they returned, and went back to the wine-shop. I had accomplished my first objective. If you can't be inconspicuous, be so damned conspicuous that nobody can miss you. And that, in itself, is a fair concealment. How many people can accurately describe a street riot? I was finishing off a bad meal with a stone bottle of worse wine when the chalk came in, disregarding the proprietor, and made straight for me. He was furred immaculately white. His velvet muzzle was contracted, as if the very smells might soil it, and he kept a dainty paw outstretched to ward off accidental contact with greasy counters or tables or tapestries. His fur was scented, and his throat circled with a collar of embroidered silk. This pampered minion surveyed me with the innocent malice of an uninvolved non-human for merely human intrigues. "'You are wanted in the great house of Shanitha, guard man,' he spoke the Shainsa dialect with an affected lisp. "'Will it please you to come with me?' I came, with no more than polite protest, but was startled. I had not expected the encounter to reach the great house so soon. Shainsa's great house had changed hands four times since I had last been in Shainsa. I wasn't overly anxious to appear there. The white chalk, as out of place in the rough dry town as a jewel in the streets or a raindrop in the desert, led me along a winding boulevard to an outlying district. He made no attempt to engage me in conversation, and indeed, I got the distinct impression that this coxcomb of a non-human considered me well beneath his notice. He seemed much more aware of the blowing dust in the street which ruffled and smudged his carefully combed fur. The great house was carved from blocks of rough pink basalt, the entry guarded by two great caryatids and wrapped in chains of carved metal, set, somehow, into the surface of the basalt. The gilt had long ago worn away from the chains, so that it alternately gleamed gold or smudged base metal. The caryatids were patient and blind, their jewel eyes long vanished under a hotter sun than today's. The entrance hall was enormous. A Terran starship could have stood upright inside it, was my first impression, but I dismissed that thought quickly. Any Terran thought was apt to betray me. But the main hall was built on a scale even more huge, and it was even colder than the legendary hell of the Chalks. It was far too big for the people in it. There was a little solar heater in the ceiling, but it didn't help much. A dim glow came from a metal brazier, but that didn't help much either. The chalk melted into the shadows, and I went down the steps into the hall by myself, feeling carefully for each step with my feet, and trying not to seem to be doing so. My comparative night-blindness is the only significant way in which I really differ from a native wolfen. There were three men, two women, and a child in the room. They were all dry-towners, and had an obscure family likeness, and they all wore rich garments of fur dyed in many colors. One of the men, old and stooped and withered, was doing something to the brazier. A slim boy of fourteen was sitting cross-legged on a pile of cushions in the corner. There was something wrong with his legs. A girl of ten, in a too-short smock that showed long, spider-thin legs above her low leather boots, was playing with some sort of shimmery crystals, spilling them out into patterns and scooping them up again from the uneven stones of the floor. One of the women was a fat, creased slattern whose jewels and dyed furs did not disguise her greasy slovenliness. Her hands were unchained, and she was biting into a fruit which dripped red juice down the rich blue fur of her robe. The old man gave her a look like murder as I came in, and she straightened slightly, but did not discard the fruit. The whole room had a curious look of austere, dignified poverty, to which the fat woman was the only discordant note. But it was the remaining man and woman who drew my attention, so that I noticed the others only peripherally in their outermost orbit. One was Kiral, standing at the foot of the dais and glowering at me. The other was the dark-eyed woman I had rebuked today in the public square. Kiral said, "'So it's you,' and his voice held nothing. Not rebuke, not friendliness or lack of it, not even hatred. Nothing. There was only one way to meet it. I faced the girl." She was sitting on a throne-like chair next to the fat woman and looked like a doe next to a pig, and said boldly, "'I assume this summons to mean that you informed your kinsman of my offer.' She flushed, and that was triumph enough. I held back the triumph, however, wary of overconfidence. The gaffer laughed the high cackle of age, and Kiral broke in with a sharp, angry monosyllable, by which I knew that my remark had indeed been repeated, and had lost nothing in the telling." but only the line of his jaw betrayed the anger as he said calmly, "'Be quiet, Delisa. Where did you pick this up?' I said boldly. 
The great house has changed rulers since last I smelled the salt cliffs. Newcomers do not know my name, and theirs is unknown to me. The old gaffer said thinly to Kural, Our name has lost Kirhar. One daughter is lured away by the toy-maker, and another babbles with strangers in the square, and a homeless no good of the streets does not know our name. My eyes, growing accustomed to the dark blaze of the brazier, saw that Kiral was biting his lip and scowling. Then he gestured to a table where an array of glassware was set, and at the gesture the white chalk came on noiseless feet and poured wine. "'If you have no blood feud with my family, will you drink with me?' "'I will,' I said, relaxing. Even if he had associated the traitor with the scarred earthmen of the spaceport, he seemed to have decided to drop the matter. He seemed startled, but he waited until I had lifted the glass and taken a sip. Then, with a movement like lightning, he leaped from the dais and struck the glass from my lips. I staggered back, wiping my cut mouth, in a split second juggling possibilities. The insult was terrible, and deadly. I could do nothing now but fight. Men had been murdered in Shainsaw for far less. I had come to settle one feud, not involve myself in another, but even while these lightning thoughts flickered in my mind, I had whipped out my skein and I was surprised at the shrillness of my own voice. "'You contrive a fence beneath your own roof!' "'Spy and renegade!' Kiral thundered. He did not touch his skein. From the table he caught a long, four-thonged whip, making it whistle through the air. The long-legged child scuttled backward. I stepped back one pace, trying to conceal my desperate puzzlement. I could not guess what had prompted Kiral's attack, but whatever it was, I must have made some bad mistake and could count myself lucky to get out of there alive. Kiral's voice perceptibly trembled with rage. "'You dare to come into my own home after I have tracked you to the Kharsa and back, blind fool that I was! But now you shall pay!' The whip sang through the air, hissing past my shoulders. I dodged to one side, retreating step by step as Kiral swung the powerful thongs. It cracked again, and a pain like the burning of red-hot iron seared my upper arm. My skein rattled down from numb fingers. The whip whacked the floor. "'Pick up your skein,' said Kiral. "'Pick it up if you dare!' He poised the lash again. The fat woman screamed. I stood rigid, gauging my chances of disarming him with a sudden leap. Suddenly the girl, Dalisa, leaped from her seat with a harsh, musical chiming of chains. Kiral, no! No, Kiral! He moved slightly, but did not take his eyes from me. Get back, Dalisa! No, wait! She ran to him and caught his whip arm, dragging it down, and spoke to him hurriedly and urgently. Kiral's face changed as she spoke. He drew a long breath and threw the whip down beside my skein on the floor. "'Answer straight on your life. What are you doing in Shainsa?' I could hardly take it in that for the moment I was reprieved from sudden death, from being beaten into bloody death here at Carole's feet. The girl went back to her throne-like chair. Now I must either tell the truth, or a convincing lie, and I was lost in a game where I didn't know the rules. The explanation I thought might get me out alive might be the very one which would bring down instant and painful death. Suddenly, with a poignancy that was almost pain— I wished Rakal were standing here at my side. But I had to bluff it out alone. If they had recognized me for Race Cargill, the Terran spy who had often been in Shainsa, they might release me. It was possible, I supposed, that they were Terran sympathizers. On the other hand, Kural's shouts of spy, renegade, seemed to suggest the opposite. I stood, trying to ignore the searing pain in my lashed arm, but I knew that blood was running hot down my shoulder. Finally, I said... I came to settle blood feud. Kiral's lips thinned in what might have been meant for a smile. You shall, assuredly, but with whom remains to be seen. Knowing I had nothing more to lose, I said, with a renegade called Rakal Sensar. Only the old man echoed my words dully. Rakal Sensar. I felt heartened, seeing I wasn't dead yet. I have sworn to kill him. Kiral suddenly clapped his hands and shouted to the white chalk to clean up the broken glass on the floor. He said huskily, "'You are not yourself, recall Sensar.' "'I told you he wasn't,' said Dalisa, high and hysterical. "'I told you he wasn't!' A scarred man, tall. What was I to think? Kiral sounded and looked badly shaken. He filled a glass himself and handed it to me, saying hoarsely, "'I did not believe even the renegade recall would break the code so far as to drink with me.' He would not. I could be positive about this." The codes of Terra had made some superficial impress on Recall, but down deep his own world held sway. If these men were at blood feud with Recall, and he stood here where I stood, he would have let himself be beaten into bloody rags before tasting their wine. I took the glass, raised it, and drained it. Then, holding it out for more, I said, 
recalls life is mine, but I swear by the red star and by the unmoving mountains, by the black snow and by the ghost wind, I have no quarrel with any beneath this roof. I cast the glass to the floor where it shattered on the stones. Kiral hesitated, but under the blazing eyes of the girl he quickly poured himself a glass of wine and drank a few sips, then flung down the glass. He stepped forward and laid his hands on my shoulders. I winced as he touched the welt of the lash and could not raise my own arm to complete the ceremonial toast. Kiral stepped away and shrugged. "'Shall I have one of the women see to your hurt?' He looked at Dalasa, but she twisted her mouth. "'Do it yourself!' "'It is nothing,' I said, not truthfully, "'but I demand in requital that since we are bound by spilled blood under your roof, "'that you give me what news you have of recall, the spy and renegade.' Kiral said fiercely, "'If I knew, would I be under my own roof?' The old gaffer on the dais broke into shrill whining laughter. "'You have drunk with him, Kiral. Now he's bound you not to do him harm.' I know the story of Rakal. He was a spy for Terra twelve years. Twelve years! And then he fought and flung their filthy money in their faces and left them. But his partner was some dry-town half-breed or Terran spy, and they fought with clawed gloves, and near killed one another, except the Terrans, who have no honor, stopped him. See the marks of the kafir on his face? By Shara the Golden Chained, said Kiral, gazing at me with something like a grin. You are, if nothing else, a very clever man. What are you, spy, or half-caste of some Ardkaran slut? What I am doesn't matter to you, I said. You have blood feud with Rakal, but mine is older than yours, and his life is mine. As you are bound in honor to kill, the formal phrases came easily now to my tongue, the earthman had slipped away, so you are bound in honor to help me kill, if anyone beneath your roof knows anything of Rakal. Kiral's smile bared his teeth. Rakal works against the son of the ape he said, using the insulting wolf term for the Terrans. If we help you to kill him, we remove a goad from our flanks. I prefer to let the filthy Tyrannans spend their strength trying to remove it themselves. Moreover, I believe you are yourself an Earthman. You have no right to the courtesy I extend to we, the people of the sky, yet you have drunk wine with me and I have no quarrel with you. He raised his hand in dismissal, outfencing me. Leave my roof in safety, and my city with honor. I could not protest or plead. A man's kirhar, his personal dignity, is a precious thing in Shainsa, and he had placed me so I could not compromise mine further in words. Yet I lost Kirhal equally if I left at his bidding like an inferior dismissed. One desperate gamble remained. A word, I said, raising my hand, and while he half turned startled, believing I was indeed about to compromise my dignity by a further plea, I flung it at him. I will bet Shegri with you. His iron composure looked shaken. I had delivered a blow to his belief that I was an earthman, for it is doubtful if there are six earthmen on wolf who know about Shegri, the dangerous game of the dry towns. It is no ordinary gamble, for what the better stakes is his life, possibly his reason. Rarely indeed will a man beg Shegri unless he has nothing further to lose. It is a cruel, possibly decadent game, which has no parallel anywhere in the known universe. But I had no choice. I had struck a cold trail in Shainsa. Rakal might be anywhere on the planet, and half of Magnuson's month was already up. Unless I could force Kiral to tell what he knew, I might as well quit. So I repeated, I will bet Shegri with you. And Kiral stood unmoving. For what the Shegrin wagers is his courage and endurance in the face of torture and an unknown fate. On his side, the stakes are clearly determined beforehand but if he loses, his punishment or penalty is at the whim of the one who has accepted him, and he may be put to whatever doom the winner determines. And this is the contest. The chagrin permits himself to be tortured from sunrise to sunset. If he endures, he wins. It is as simple as that. He can stop the torture at any moment by a word, but to do so is a concession of defeat. This is not as dangerous as it might at first seem, the other party to the bet is bound by the ironclad codes of Wolf to inflict no permanent physical damage, no injury that will not heal with three sun courses. But from sunrise to sunset, any torment or painful ingenuity which the half human mentality of Wolf can devise must be endured. The man who can outthink the torture of the moment, the man who can hold in his mind the single thought of his goal, that man can claim the stakes he has set, as well as other concessions made traditional. The silence grew in the hall. Dalisa had straightened and was watching me intently. Her lips parted and the tip of a little red tongue visible between her teeth. The only sound was the tiny crunching as the fat woman nibbled at nuts and cast their shells into the brazier. 
Even the child on the steps had abandoned her game with the crystal dice and sat looking up at me with her mouth open. Finally, Kiral demanded, "'Your stakes? Tell me all you know of Rakal Sansar and keep silence about me and Shane Sa. "'By the red shadow!' Kiral burst out. "'You have courage, Raskar. "'Say only yes or no,' I retorted. Rebuked, he fell silent. Dallas leaned forward, and again, for some unknown reason, I thought of a girl with hair like spun black glass. Kiral raised his hand. I say no. I have blood feud with Rakal, and I will not sell his death to another. Further, I believe you are Terran, and I will not deal with you. And finally, you have twice saved my life, and I would find small pleasure in torturing you. I say no. Drink again with me, and we part without a quarrel. Beaten, I turned to go. Wait, said Dalisa. She stood up and came down the dais, slowly this time, walking with dignity to the rhythm of her musically clashing chains. I have a quarrel with this man. I started to say that I did not quarrel with women, and stopped myself. The Terran concept of chivalry has no equivalent on Wolf. She looked at me with her dark, poison-berry eyes, icy and level and amused, and said, I will bet Shegri with you, unless you fear me, Raskar. And I knew suddenly that if I lost... I might better have trusted myself to Kiral and his whip, or to the wild beast things of the mountains. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Door Through Space This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. Recording by Christy Nowak The Door Through Space by Marion Zimmer Bradley Chapter 8 I slept little that night. There is a tale told in Delon of the Chagri, where a challenger was left in a room alone, where he was blindfolded and told to await the beginning of the torment. Somewhere in those dark hours of waiting, between the unknown and the unexpected, the hours of telling over to himself the horrors of past Chagri, the torture of anticipation alone became unbearable. A little past noon he collapsed in screams of horror and died, raving, unmarred, untouched. Daybreak came slowly, and with the first streamers of light came Dalisa, with the white chalk, maliciously uninvolved, sniffing his way through the shabby poverty of the great hall. They took me to a lower dungeon where the slant of the sunlight was less visible. Dalisa said, "'The sun has risen.' I said nothing. Any word may be interpreted as a confession of defeat. I resolved to give them no excuse— but my skin crawled, and I had that peculiar prickling sensation where the hair on my forearms was bristling erect with tension and fear. Dalisa said to the chalk, "'His gear was not searched. See that he has swallowed no anesthetic drugs.' Briefly I gave her credit for thoroughness, even while I wondered in a split second why I had not thought of this. Drugs could blur consciousness, at least, or suspend reality. The white non-human sprang forward and pinioned my arms with one strong, spring-steel forearm. With his other hand he forced my jaws open. I felt the furred fingers at the back of my throat, gagged, struggled briefly, and doubled up in uncontrollable retching. Delisa's poison-berry eyes regarded me levelly as I struggled upright, fighting off the dizzy sickness of disgust. Something about her impassive face stopped me cold. I had been momentarily raging with fury and humiliation. Now I realized that this had been a calculated, careful gesture to make me lose my temper, and thus sap my resistance. If she could set me to fighting, if she could make me spend my strength in rage, my own imagination would fight on her side to make me lose control before the end. Swimming in the glare of her eyes, I realized she had never thought for a moment that I had taken any drug. Acting on Carell's hint that I was a Terran, she was taking advantage of the well-known Terran revulsion for the non-human. "'Blindfold him,' Delisa commanded, then instantly countermanded that. "'No. Strip him first. The chalk ripped off shirt-cloak, shirt, shoes, breeches, and I had my first triumph when the wheeled claw-marks on my shoulders, worse if possible than those which disfigured my face, were laid bare. The chalk screwed up his muzzle in fastidious horror, and Elisa looked shaken. I could almost read her thoughts. If he endured this, what hope have I to make him cry mercy? Briefly I remembered the months I lay feverish and half-dead, waiting for the wounds Rakal had inflicted to heal, those months when I had believed that nothing would ever hurt me again, that I had known the worst of all suffering. But I had been younger then. Delisa had picked up two small, sharp knives. She weighed them, briefly gesturing to the chalk. Without resisting, I let myself be manhandled backward, spread-eagled against the wall. 
Delisa commanded. Drive the knives through his palms to the wall. My hands twitched convulsively, anticipating the slash of steel, and my throat closed in spasmodic dread. This was breaking the compact, bound as they were not to inflict physical damage. I opened my lips to protest this breaking of the bond of honor and met her dark, blazing stare, and suddenly the sweat broke out on my forehead. I had placed myself wholly in her hands, and as Kural had said, they were in no way bound by honor to respect a pledge to a Terran. Then, as my hands clenched into fists, I forced myself to relax. This was a bluff, a mental trick to needle me into breaking the pact and pleading for mercy. I set my lips, spread my palms wide against the wall, and waited impassively. She said in her lilting voice, "'Take care not to sever the tendons, or his hands would be paralyzed, and he may claim we have broken our compact.' The points of the steel, razor-sharp, touched my palms, and I felt blood run down my hand before the pain. With an effort that turned my face white, I did not pull away from the point. The knives drove deeper. Delisa gestured to the chalk. The knives dropped. Two pinpricks, a quarter of an inch deep, stung in my palm. I had outbluffed her. Had I? If I had expected her to betray disappointment, and I had, I was disappointed. Abruptly, as if the game had wearied her already, she gestured, and I could not hold back a gasp as my arms were hauled up over my head, twisted violently around one another, and trussed with thin cords that bit deep into the flesh. Then the rough upward pull almost jerked my shoulders from their sockets, and I heard the giant chalk grunt with effort as I was hauled upward until my feet barely on tiptoe touched the floor. "'Blindfold him,' said Dalisa languidly, "'so that he cannot watch the ascent of the sun or its descent, or know what is to come.' A dark softness muffled my eyes. After a little I heard her steps retreating. My arms wrenched overhead, and numbed with the bite of the cords were beginning to hurt badly now. But it wasn't too bad. Surely she did not mean that this should be all. Sternly I controlled my imagination, taking a tight rein on my thoughts. There was only one way to meet this, hanging blind and racked in space, my toes barely scrabbling at the floor, and that was to take each thing as it came and not look ahead for an instant. First of all, I tried to get my feet under me, and discovered that by arching upwards to my fullest height, I could bear my weight on tiptoe and ease a little the dislocating ache in my armpits by slackening the overhead rope. But after a little, a cramping pain began to flare through the arches of my feet, and it became impossible to support my weight on tiptoe. I jarred down with violent strain on my wrists and wrenched shoulders again, and for a moment the shooting agony was so intense that I nearly screamed. I thought I heard a soft breath near me. After a little it subsided to a sharp ache then to a dull ache, and then to the violent cramping again, and once more I struggled to get my toes under me. I realized that by allowing my toes barely to touch the floor, they had doubled and tripled the pain by the tantalizing hope of, if not momentary relief, at least the alteration of one pain for another. I haven't the faintest idea, even now, how long I repeated that agonizing cycle, struggle for a toehold on rough stone, scraping my bare feet raw, arch upward with all my strength to release for a few moments the strain on my wrenched shoulders, the momentary illusion of relief as I found my balance, and the pressure lightened on my wrists. Then the slow creeping, first of an ache, then of a pain, then of a violent agony in the arches of my feet and calves, and, delayed to the last endurable moment, that final terrible anguish when the drop of my full weight pulled shoulder and wrist and elbow joints with that bone-shattering jerk. I started once to estimate how much time had passed, how many hours had crawled by, then checked myself, for that was imminent madness." But once the process had begun, my brain would not abandon, and I found myself, with compulsive precision, counting off the seconds and the minutes in each cycle. Stretch upward, release the pressure on the arms, the beginning of pain in the calves and arches and toes, the creeping of pain up the ribs and loins and shoulders, the sudden jarring drop on the arms again. My throat was intolerably dry. Under other circumstances, I might have estimated the time by the growing hunger and thirst, but the rough treatment I had received made this impossible. There were other— unmentionable, humiliating pains. After a time, to bolster my flagging courage, I found myself thinking of all the ways it might have been worse. I have heard of a chagrin exposed to the bite of poisonous, not fatal but painfully poisonous, insects, and to the worrying of the small, gnawing rodents which can be trained to bite and tear. Or I might have been branded. I banished the memory with a powerful exorcism, the man in Delon whose anticipation alone of a torture which never came had broken his mind. There was only one way to conquer this, and that was to act as if the present moment was the only one, and never for a moment to forget that the strongest of compacts bound them not to harm me, that the end of this was fixed by sunset. Gradually, however, 
all such rational thoughts blurred in the semi-delirium of thirst and pain, narrowing to a red blaze of agony across my shoulder-blades. I eased up on my toes again. White-hot pain blazed through my feet. The rough stone on which my toes sank had been covered with metal, and I smelled scorching flesh, jerking up my feet with a wordless snarl of rage and fury, hanging in agony by my shoulders alone. And then I lost consciousness, at least for several moments, for when I became aware again through the nightmare of pain, my toes were resting lightly and securely on cold stone. The smell of burned flesh remained, and the painful stinging in my toes. Mingled with that smell was a drift of perfume close by. Dalisa murmured, I do not wish to break our bargain by damaging your feet. It's only a little touch of fire to keep you from too much security in resting them. I felt the taste of blood mingle in my mouth with a sour taste of vomit. I felt delirious, light-headed. After another eternity, I wondered if I had really heard Delisa's lilting croon, or whether it was a nightmare born of feverish pain. Plead with me. A word. Only a word, and I will release you, strong man, scarred man. Perhaps I shall demand only a little space in your arms. Would not such doom be light upon you? Perhaps I shall set you free to seek Rakal, if only to plague Karal. A word, only a word from you, a word, only a word from you. It died into an endlessly echoing whisper, swaying blindly. I wondered why I endured. I drew a dry tongue over lips, salty and bloody, and nightmarishly considered yielding, winning my way somehow around Alisa, or knocking her suddenly senseless and escaping. I, who need not be bound by wolf's codes either— I fumbled with a stiff shape of words, and a breath saved me, a soft, released breath of anticipation. It was another trick. I swayed limp and racked. I was not race cargill now. I was a dead man hanging in chains, swinging, filthy vultures pecking at my dangling feet. The sounds of boots rang on the stone, and Kiral's voice, low and bitter, demanded somewhere behind me, "'What have you done with him?' She did not answer, but I heard her chains clash lightly and imagined her gesture. Kiral muttered, Women have no genius at any torture except— His voice faded out into great distances. Their words came to me over a sort of windy ringing like the howling of lost men dying in the snow-fast passes of the mountains. Speak up, you fool. He can't hear you now. If you have let him faint, you are clumsy. You talk of clumsiness? Dalisa's voice, even thinned by the nightmare ringing in my head, held concentrated scorn. Perhaps I shall release him to find Rakal when you failed. The Terrans have a price on Rakal's head, too— and at least this man will not confuse himself with his prey. If you think I would let you bargain with a Terranin, Delisa cried passionately, you trade with the Terrans, how would you stop me then? I trade with them because I must, but for a matter involving the honor of the great house, the great house whose steps you would never have climbed except for Rakal. Delisa sounded as if she were chewing her words in little pieces and spitting them at Keral. Oh, you were clever to take us both as your consorts. You did not know it was Rakal's doing, did you? Hate the Terrans, then, she spat an obscenity at him. Enjoy your hate. Wallow in hating, and in the end all Shane Sao will fall prey to the toy-maker, like Mei Lin. If you speak that name again, said Keral very low, I will kill you. Like Mei Lin, Mei Lin, Mei Lin, Dalisa repeated deliberately. You fool, Rakal knew nothing of Mei Lin. He was seen. With me, you fool, with me. You cannot tell twin from twin. Rakal came to me to ask news of her. Keral cried out hoarsely, like a man in anguish. Why didn't you tell me? You don't really have to ask, do you, Kral? You bitch, said Kral. You filthy bitch. I heard the sound of a blow. The next moment, Kral ripped the blindfold from my eyes, and I blinked in the blaze of light. My arms were wholly numb now, twisted above my head, but the jar of his touch sent fresh pain racing through me. Kral's face swam out of the blaze of hell. If that is true, then this is a damnable farce, Delisa. You have lost our chance of learning what he knows of Melin. What he knows? Delisa lowered her hand from her face, where a bruise was already darkening. Melin has twice appeared when I was with him. Loose him, Delisa, and bargain with him. What we know of Rakal for what he knows of Melin. If you think I would let you bargain with Tyrannin, she mocked, weakling, this quarrel is mine. You fool, the others in the caravan will give me news if you will not. Where is Quinn? From a million miles away, Carol laughed. You've slipped the wrong hawk, Delisa. The catman killed him. His skein flicked loose. He climbed to a perch near the rope at my wrists. Bargain with me, Raskar? I coughed, unable to speak, and Kiral insisted. Will you bargain? End this damned woman's farce which makes a mock of Shagri? The slant of sun told me there was light left. I found a shred of voice, not knowing what I was going to say until I had said it irrevocably. This is between Dalisa and me. Kiral glared at me in mounting rage. With four strides he was out of the room, flinging back a harsh, furious, I hope you kill each other! And the door slammed. 
Dalisa's face swam red, and again as before, I knew the battle which was joined between us would be fought to a dreadful end. She touched my chest lightly, but the touch jolted excruciating pain through my shoulders. Did you kill Quinn? I wondered wearily what this presaged. Did you? In a passion she cried. Answer! Did you kill him? She struck me hard, and where the touch had been pain, the blow was a blaze of white agony. I fainted. Answer! She struck me again, and the white blaze jolted me back to consciousness. Answer me! Answer! Each cry brought a blow until I gasped finally. He signaled. Set Catman on us. No! She stood staring at me, and her white face was a death mask in which the eyes lived. She screamed wildly, and the huge chalk came running. Cut him down! Cut him down! Cut him down! A knife slashed the rope, and I slumped, falling in a bone-breaking huddle to the floor. My arms were still twisted over my head. The chalk cut the ropes apart, pulled my arms roughly back into place, and I gagged with the pain as the blood began flowing painfully through the chafed and swollen hands. And then I lost consciousness, more or less permanently this time. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Door Through Space This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. Recording by Christy Nowak The Door Through Space by Marion Zimmer Bradley Chapter 9 when I came to again I was lying with my head in Delisa's lap, and the reddish color of the sunset was in the room. Her thighs were soft under my head, and for an instant I wondered if, in delirium, I had conceded to her. I muttered, "'Sun, not down!' She bent her face to mine, whispering, "'Hush, hush!' It was heaven, and I drifted off again. After a moment I felt a cup against my lips. "'Can you swallow this?' I could, and did. I couldn't taste it yet, but it was cold and wet, and felt heavenly trickling down my throat. She bent and looked into my eyes, and I felt as if I were falling into those reddish and stormy depths. She touched my scarred mouth with a light finger. Suddenly my head cleared and I sat upright. Is this a trick to force me into calling my bet? She recoiled as if I had struck her. Then the trace of a smile flitted around her red mouth. Yes, between us it was battle. You are right to be suspicious, I suppose. "'But if I tell you what I know of recall, will you trust me then?' I looked straight at her and said, "'No.' Surprisingly, she threw back her head and laughed. I flexed my freed wrists cautiously. The skin was torn away and chafed, and my arms ached to the bone. When I moved, harsh lances of pain drove through my chest. "'Well, until sunset I have no right to ask you to trust me,' said Delisa when she was done laughing. "'And since you are bound by my command until the last ray has fallen,' I command that you lay your head upon my knees. I blazed. You are making a game of me. Is that my privilege? Do you refuse? Refuse? It was not yet sunset. This might be a torture more complex than any which had yet greeted me. From the scarlet glint in her eyes I felt she was playing with me, as the cat things of the forest play with their helpless victims. My mouth twitched in a grimace of humiliation as I lowered myself obediently until my head rested on her fur-clad knees. She murmured, smiling, "'Is this so unbearable, then?' I said nothing. Never, never for an instant could I forget that, all human, all woman as she seemed, Dallas's race was worn and old when the Terran Empire had not left their home star. The mind of Wolf, which has mingled with the non-human since before the beginnings of recorded time, is unfathomable to an outsider. I was better equipped than most Earthmen to keep pace with its surface acts, but I could never pretend to understand its deeper motivations. It works on complex and irrational logic. Mischief is an integral part of it. Even the deadly blood feud with Recall had begun with an over-elaborate practical joke, which had lost the service, incidentally, several thousand credits worth of spaceship. And so I could not trust Dallisa for an instant. Yet it was wonderful to lie here with my head resting against the perfumed softness of her body. Then suddenly her arms were gripping me, frantic and hungry, the subdued thing in her voice. Her eyes flamed out hot and wild. She was pressing the whole length of her body to mine, breasts and thighs and long legs, and her voice was hoarse. Is this torture, too? Beneath the fur robe she was soft and white, and the subtle scent of her hair seemed a deeper entrapment than any. Frail as she seemed, her arms had the strength of steel, and pain blazed down my wrenched shoulders, seared through the twined wrists, 
Then I forgot the pain. Over her shoulder, the last dropping redness of the sun vanished and plunged the room into orchid twilight. I caught her wrists in my hands, prizing them backward, twisting them upward over her head. I said thickly, the sun's down, and then I stopped her wild mouth with mine. And I knew that the battle between us had reached climax and victory simultaneously, and any question about who had won was purely academic. During the night some time, while her dark head lay motionless on my shoulder, I found myself staring into the darkness, wakeful. The throbbing of my bruises had little to do with my sleeplessness. I was remembering other chained girls from the old days in the dry towns, and the honey and poison of them distilled into Dallas's kisses. Her head was very light on my shoulder, and she felt curiously insubstantial, like a woman of feathers. One of the tiny moons was visible through the slitted windows— I thought of my rooms in the Terran trade city, clean and bright and warm, and all the nights when I had paced the floor, hating, filled to the teeth with bitterness, longing for the wind-swept stars of the dry towns, the salt smell of the winds, and the musical clashing of the walk of the chained women. With a sting of guilt, I realized that I had half forgotten Julie, and my pledge to her, and her misfortune which had freed me again for this. Yet I had won, and what they knew had narrowed my planet-wide search to a pinpoint— Recall was in Charon. I wasn't altogether surprised. Charon is the only city on Wolf, except the Kharsa, where the Terran Empire has put down deep roots into the planet, built a trade city, a smaller spaceport. Like the Kharsa, it lies within the circle of Terran law, and a million miles outside it. A non-human town, inhabited largely by Chalks, it is the core and center of the resistance movement, a noisy town in perpetual ferment. It was the logical place for a renegade. I settled myself so that the ache in my racked shoulders was less violent, and muttered, "'Why Charon?' Slight as the movement was, it roused Dallasa. She rolled over and propped herself on her elbows, quoting drowsily, "'The prey walks safest at the hunter's door.' I stared at the square of violet moonlight, trying to fit together all the pieces of the puzzle, and asked half aloud, "'What prey? And what hunters?' Dallasa didn't answer. I hadn't expected her to answer." I asked the real question in my mind, why does Kural hate Rakal Sansar when he doesn't even know him by sight? There are reasons, she said somberly. One of them is Melin, my twin sister. Kural climbed the steps of the great house by claiming us both as his consorts. He is our father's son by another wife. That explained much. Brother and sister marriages, not uncommon in the dry towns, are based on expediency and suspicion, and are frequently, though not always, loveless. It explained Dallas's taunts, and it partly explained, only partly, why I found her in my arms. It did not explain Rakal's part in this mysterious intrigue, nor why Kiral had taken me for Rakal, but only after he remembered seeing me in Terran clothing. I wondered why it had never occurred to me before that I might be mistaken for Rakal. There was no close resemblance between us, but a casual description would apply equally well to me or to Rakal. My height is unusual for a Terran, within an inch of Rakal's own, and we had roughly the same build— the same coloring. I had copied his walk, imitated his mannerisms, since we were boys together. And, blurring minor facial characteristics, there were the scars of the kefich on my mouth, cheeks, and shoulders. Anyone who did not know us by sight, anyone who had known us by reputation from the days when we had worked together in the dry towns, might easily take one of us for the other. Even Julie had blurted, "'You're so much alike!' before thinking better of it. Other odd bits of the puzzle floated in my mind, stubbornly refusing to take on recognizable patterns. The disappearance of a toy seller, Julie's hysterical babbling, the way the girl, Melin, had vanished into a shrine of Nebron, and the taunts of Dallasa and the old man about a mysterious toy-maker. And something, some random joggling of a memory, in that eerie trading in the city of the Silent Ones. I knew all these things fitted together somehow, but I had no real hope that Dallasa could complete their pattern for me. She said, with a vehemence that startled me, "'Maylin is only the excuse. Kiral hates Rakal because Rakal will compromise, and because he'll fight.' She rolled over and pressed herself against me in the darkness. Her voice trembled. "'Race, our world is dying. We can't stand against Terra, and there are other things, worse things.' I sat up, surprised to find myself defending Terra to this girl. After all these years I was back in my own world, and yet, and yet, I heard myself say quietly— the Terrans aren't exploiting Wolf. We haven't abolished the rule of Shane Sa. We've changed nothing. 
It was true. Terra held Wolf by compact, not conquest. They paid, and paid generously for the lease of the lands where their trade cities would rise, and stepped beyond them only when invited to do so. We let any city or state that wants to keep its independence govern itself until it collapses, Dalisa. And they do collapse after a generation or so. Very few primitive planets can hold out against us. The people themselves get tired of living under feudal or theocratic systems, and they beg to be taken into the Empire. That's all. But that's just it, Dalisa argued. You give the people all those things we used to give them, and you do it better. Just by being here, you're killing the dry towns. They're turning to you and leaving us, and you let them do it. I shook my head. We've kept the Terran peace for centuries. What do you expect? Should we give you arms, planes, bombs, weapons to hold your slaves down? Yes, she flared at me. The dry towns have ruled wolves since, since, you, you can't even imagine how long. And we made compact with you to trade here. And we have rewarded you by leaving you untouched, I said quietly. But we have not forbidden the dry towns to come into the empire and work with Terra. She said bitterly, men like Keral will die first, and pressed her face helplessly against me. And I will die with them. Melen broke away, but I cannot. Courage is what I lack. Our world is rotten, race, rotten all through, and I'm as rotten as the core of it. I could have killed you today, and I'm here in your arms. Our world is rotten, but I've no confidence that the new world will be better. I put my hand under her chin and looked down gravely into her face, only a pale oval in the darkness. There was nothing I could say. She had said it all, and truthfully. I had hated and yearned and starved for this, and when I found it, it turned salty and bloody on my lips, like Dallas's despairing kisses. She ran her fingers over the scars on my face, then gripped her small, thin hands around my wrists so fiercely that I grunted protest. "'You will not forget me,' she said in her strangely lilting voice. "'You will not forget me, although you were victorious.' She twisted and lay looking up at me, her eyes glowing faintly luminous in darkness. I knew that she could see me as clearly as if it were day. "'I think it was my victory, not yours, Race Cargill.' Gently, on an impulse I could not explain, I picked up one delicate wrist, then the other, unclasping the heavy, jeweled bracelets. She let out a stifled cry of dismay. And then I tossed the chains into a corner, before I drew her savagely into my arms again, and forced her head back under my mouth. I said good-bye to her alone in the reddish, wind-swept space before the great house. She pressed her head against my shoulder and whispered, "'Race, take me with you.' For answer, I only picked up her narrow wrists and turned them over on my palm. The jeweled bracelets were clasped again around the thinly boned joints, and on some self-punishing impulse, she had shortened the chains so that she could not even put her arms around me. I lifted the punished wrists to my mouth and kissed them gently. You don't want to leave, Dalisa. I was desperately sorry for her. She would go down with her dying world, proud and cold and with no place in the new one. She kissed me, and I tasted blood her thin, fettered body straining wildly against me, shaken with tearing, convulsive sobs. Then she turned and fled back into the shadow of the great dark house. I never saw her again. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Door Through Space This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. Recording by Christy Nowak The Door Through Space by Marion Zimmer Bradley Chapter 10 A few days later I found myself nearing the end of the trail. It was twilight in Charon, hot and reeking with the gypsy glare of fires which burned smoking at the far end of the street of the sick shepherds. I crouched in the shadow of a wall, waiting. My skin itched from the dirty shirt-cloak I hadn't changed in days. Shabbiness is wise in non-human parts, and dry-towners think too much of water to waste much of it in superfluous washing anyhow. I scratched unobtrusively, and glanced cautiously down the street. It seemed empty, except for a few sodden, derelicts sprawled in doorways. The street of the sick shepherds is a filthy slum, but I made sure my skin was loose. Charon is not a particularly safe town, even for dry-towners, and especially not for earthmen, at any time. Even with what Dallas had told me, the search had been difficult. Charon is not Shane Saw. In Charon, where human and non-human live closer together than anywhere else on the planet, information about such men as Rakal can be bought, but the policy is to let the buyer beware. That's fair enough. 
because the life of the cellar has a way of not being worth much afterward either. A dirty, dust-laden wind was blowing up along the street, heavy with strange smells. The pungent reek of incense from a street shrine was in the smells, the heavy, acrid odor that made my skin crawl. In the hills behind Charon, the ghost wind was rising. Born on this wind, the yamen would sweep down from the mountains, and everything human or nearly human would scatter in their path. They would range through the quarter all night, and in the morning they would melt away, until the ghost wind blew again. At any other time, I would already have taken cover. I fancied that I could hear, borne on the wind, the far away yelping, and envision the plumed, taloned figures which would come leaping down the street. In that moment, the quiet of the street split asunder. From somewhere, a girl's voice screamed in shrill pain or panic. Then I saw her, dodging between two of the chinked pebble houses. She was a child, thin and barefoot, a long tangle of black hair flying loose as she darted and twisted to elude the lumbering fellow at her heels. His outstretched paw jerked cruelly at her slim wrist. The little girl screamed and wrenched herself free and threw herself straight on me, wrapping herself around my neck with the violence of a storm wind. Her hair got in my mouth, and her small hands gripped at my neck like a cat's flexed claws. "'Oh, help me!' she gasped between sobs. "'Don't let him get me! Don't!' And even in the broken plea, I took it in that the little ragamuffin did not speak the jargon of that slum, but the pure speech of Shane Sa. What I did then was as automatic as if it had been Julie. I pulled the kid loose, shoved her behind me, and scowled at the brute who lurched toward us. "'Make yourself scarce,' I advised. "'We don't chase little girls where I come from. Haul off now.' The man reeled. I smelled the rankness of his rags as he thrust one grimy paw at the girl. I never was the hero type." but I'd started something which I had to carry through. I thrust myself between them and put my hand on the skein again. "'You! You dry towner! the man set up a tipsy howl, and I sucked in my breath. Now I was in for it. Unless I got out of there damned fast, I'd lose what I'd come all the way to Charon to find. I felt like handing the girl over. For all I knew, the bully could be her father, and she was properly in line for a spanking. This wasn't any of my business. My business lay at the end of the street, where Rakal was waiting at the fires. He wouldn't be there long. Already the smell of the ghost wind was heavy and harsh, and little flurries of sand went racing along the street, lifting the flaps of the doorways. But I did nothing so sensible. The big lunk made a grab at the girl, and I whipped out my skein and pantomimed, "'Get going!' "'Dry, towner!' He spat out the word like filth, his pig eyes narrowing to slits. "'Son of the ape! Earth man! Tyrannan!' Someone took up the howl. There was a stir, a rustle all along the street that had seemed empty, and from nowhere, it seemed, the space in front of me was crowded with shadowy forms, human and otherwise. Earthman! I felt the muscles across my belly nodding into a band of ice. I didn't believe I'd given myself away as an Earthman. The bully was using this time-dishonored tactic of stirring up a riot in a hurry, but just the same, I looked quickly round, hunting a path of escape. Put your skein in his gut, Spilker! Grab him! Hi! Earthman, hi! It was the last cry that made me panic. Through the sultry glare at the end of the street, I could see the plumed, taloned figures of the yamen gliding through the banners of smoke. The crowd melted open. I didn't stop to reflect on the fact, suddenly very obvious, that Rakal couldn't have been at the fires at all, and that my informant had led me into an open trap, a nest of yamen already inside Charon. The crowd edged back and muttered, and suddenly I made my choice. I whirled, snatched up the girl in my arms, and ran straight toward the advancing figures of the yamen. Nobody followed me. I even heard a choked shout that sounded like a warning. I heard the yelping shrieks of the yamen grow to a wild howl, and at the last minute, when their stiff, rustling plumes loomed only a few yards away, I dived sideways into an alley, stumbled on some rubbish, and spilled the girl down. Run, kid! She shook herself like a puppy, climbing out of the water. Her small fingers closed like a steel trap on my wrist. This way! She urged in a hasty whisper, and I found myself plunging out the far end of the alley and into the shelter of a street shrine. The sour stink of incense smarted in my nostrils, and I could hear the yelping of the yamen as they leaped and rustled down the alley, their cold and poisonous eyes searching out the recesses where I crouched with the girl. Here, she panted. Stand close to me on the stone. I drew back, startled. Oh, don't stop to argue, she whimpered. Come here. Hi, Earthman, there he is. The girl's arms flung round me again. I felt her slight, hard body pressing on mine, and she literally hauled me toward the pattern of stones in the center of the shrine. I wouldn't have been human if I hadn't caught her closer yet. The world reeled. The street disappeared in a cone of spinning lights. Stars danced crazily, and I plunged down through a widening gulf of empty space, locked in the girl's arms. I fell, spun, plunged, head over heels, through tilting lights and shadows that flung us through the eternities of freefall. 
the yelping of the yamen whirled away in unimaginable distances, and for a second I felt the unmerciful blackout of a power dive, with blood breaking from my nostrils and filling my mouth. End of chapter 10